How do you build a network, run a profitable business, and make an impact, oh, and have a personal life at the same time? That's the question, and this podcast is the answer. I'm your host, Chaz Wilson, husband, father of five, author of the book, Five Plus One, president and co-founder of Master Networks Inc., a national networking organization. Look, each week I bring you successful entrepreneurs who will share success strategies of how to effectively build a network, add valuable wisdom to your journey, and help you succeed. Welcome to Connect, Share, and Prosper. All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of Connect, Share, Prosper. We are joined today with uh, upcoming Connect keynote speaker, uh, husband, father, best-selling author, Super Bowl champion, and one of my favorites, the Reverend of the Revolution. I, got, I stumbled over that, the Reverend of the Revolution. That's, that's a tongue twister. Welcome, Satema Ghali, to Connect, Share, Prosper. Thanks for joining us. Chaz, great to be here. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm looking forward to being together here for the next little bit. Yeah, man. Thank you for joining us. I, we were just talking before I hit record, and Satema's been training for, are you doing a full marathon? Is that, is that the goal? Half marathon. Half marathon. And yes. so, but you did, you did one, right? You ran one as a practice, right? Or I did. I actually ran 13 miles. I, I saved the point one for the, the real deal. And, yeah. uh, you know, just to go back, I, like I'm six foot four, 280 pounds, played football professional. And, yeah. you know, look, we're, I'm not a runner. I've never been a runner. So this for me is like my next Super Bowl. Uh, I've been training yeah. hard, put, logging hundreds of miles. And I can't wait. I'm actually 48 hours away from running the half. So. Oh, wow. Oh, awesome, man. So best to you. I know you've been struggling. Like after you ran that, you got, you fell ill, your kids have been sick and, and you caught that and, and you've been struggling with that. And so, uh, man, best to you on that. So thank you. thank you for taking the time to be with us today. So I want to go back to something you just said, and I can see your jersey there on the wall. So you, you played in the NFL, uh, played for the uh, New England Patriots, and you played in and won a Super Bowl. Yeah, Super Bowl 36, Patriots versus the Rams, 2001-2002, uh, one of the best years of my life. Yeah, so what, here, here's the thing. So few people play in the NFL, and then so much fewer that ever get the opportunity to go to a Super Bowl – and win the Super Bowl. So you're in this elite of the elite kind of club. But take every, I mean, so few people get to experience that. What was it like? Like, what, what do people want to know? Like, there's so much people want to go, hey, what was it like to step on that field, play at that level, and then be a champion at that level? What was it like for you? Look, uh, take the best day you've ever had. Like, for me, uh, marrying my wife, yeah. the birth of my children, and it's there. It, and, it, and it's such a different level because – to, you know, as a child, you practice and you try out and you're, you're, in, you're running and you're playing games and then you're in college and the pinnacle is the Super Bowl for football. Mm -hmm. And when we got there, you know, I mean, I was, I was a rookie just out of college, but when we got down to New Orleans, that was just after 9-11 had happened. So oh, yeah. you know, the, the country's going through this, this, this shift and this turmoil and this, this coming together and when we got to the Superdome and we walked in, grown men crying. Like this was just the practice. I think we went there, we got there like on a Thursday or Friday. Media day was like on, I think a Monday. And we walked in, I mean, all of us. It's like, yeah. it, it's so difficult to describe because you work so hard, you know, like, like so you were overwhelmed because of how hard you, it, was, it was there, right? You were there. Like, it, like we were actually there. Like, yeah. and, and this is before the nice smartphones. So everyone's got their camcorders and recording and <laughs> right. doing each other's things. And, but, you know, Chas, just to, like, this is why I love helping people accomplish goals because I tell people, look, you, you may not go to the Super Bowl, but you have a Super Bowl in your life that you can reset frequently throughout the year of, you know, for me, it's this half marathon coming up. So, yeah, yeah. and then when we won, look, I, when we won the game, I mean, grown men hugging, looking at each other. I love you, man. Crying. Like just voices are gone. Yeah. One of the greatest feelings like, and like people, you, you don't have to go in the Super Bowl to experience that. You can actually experience that frequently, but I tell you, it's yeah, that's one cool. of the best feelings ever, man. So, so after you won the Super Bowl, um, how, how much longer were you in the NFL? So short, um, my second year, at the end of the second year, I came home. So after two years, okay. uh, Super Bowl is year one. 
uh, after my wow. second year, I came to a short, small, not for long way. NFL stands for not for long. Everyone knows like right, it's right. Right. And uh, I came home in uh, 2003 was done. And look, Let I me ask you really quick before you go yeah. for it. You say I came home. Like you keep yeah. using that phrase and, and uh, I'm not sure everyone listening would understand what that means because that, that means because you're always on the road, right? But you're always. Well, e- even like when I was out in New England, even though players um, live where they play, yeah, home yeah. is still home. I got right? you. Home is home. And, and there's, and it, maybe you, you play, like I have a buddy of mine I played uh, BYU with. His name is Chris Hoke, played for the Steelers. He had a 10 year career. So home now for him is Pittsburgh, right? That's where he raised his kids, his family. He's done for 10 years. Yeah, but yeah. a lot of players, uh, like, again, the guy I played with, Lloyd Malloy, he went to University of Washington. He's back in Washington. So I follow these guys, and we follow each other on social media. And unless you stay there for 10 or 12 years, home is home. So when I say I came I back home, like home is, you know, home is Utah for me. Yeah, okay. So you get back home. Yep. Come back home and look, you know, when you've been a football player, in fact, you'll see this with Dwayne Wade right now in the NBA. I was watching some things about Dwayne Wade, him and his wife, Gabrielle Union. And he's like, I I don't even know what to do with my life. Like, yeah, how how much do things cost? Like, because as a player, everything is done for you. And so when I came home from the NFL, I'm lost. I don't have football anymore. I'm not in college anymore. I graduated from BYU. Yeah. What do I do? I don't know how to do a resume. I don't know how to apply for, I don't know any of these normal skills. So for about seven, eight months, I go broke pretty fast. Money's not there. And I'm just kind of a bum. Like, I'm just like, what do I got a Super Bowl ring in my hand. I got a college degree. I was the poster boy at BYU and I'm the Super Bowl champ with like no purpose. And in my heart, I knew Chaz, I knew that I was meant to do something big. So yeah. a buddy of mine, he was literally doing um, mortgages at the time, shows me his mortgage check and it was significant. It was like $30,000. And I was like, was that last year? He's like, that was last month. Wow, yeah. And once that happened, I jumped into the mortgage industry toward uh, ladder 2003 and I committed. I just, I was just little, this kid, I didn't know what I was doing. I just said, I'm gonna take what I did in football and I'm going to apply this. Yeah. To the mortgage industry. So you came out of the NFL and you had to reinvent yourself. I had to reinvent and start again, mm-hmm. transition. And it was a very difficult time because right? my identity had been football. My identity had been, I'm the football guy. And now I'm like, I have no business acumen. I have no business skills. I know nothing about marketing. I know nothing about sales. I know nothing about mortgages and rates and real estate. So I applied the, the football principles. I yeah. just, I did football. Yeah. I'm going to do this in mortgages. People said I was crazy. And uh, I went and hit my goals in 2004, doubled it in 2005, doubled that in 2006, and then doubled 2007. So it was an amazing rise yeah. in that industry. Hold on. Yeah. landscapers are here yep yep so like it's funny and this is a side note because so many people have watched my podcast know and i joked on the last one that i feel like the guy who does our landscaping for this building knows when i go live on my podcast because the like three episodes in a row he's never here during the week as soon as i went live he's he's cutting the uh you know with the the trip weed trip. Yeah. yeah and apparently we must have the biggest weed in the world that he tries to hack here for 10 minutes he can't get rid of it's like right out the window yeah. so it's, it's kind of funny that happened actually okay so let's 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 stick with that for the on on the reinventing yourself because i think people listening to this you know we've got entrepreneurs all over the the country and some across the world who this happens in business too. Like it might be from football to, to mortgages, or it might be from, um, you know, an office job to now I'm an entrepreneur. It might be something else to now, you know, health and wellness. And so like, do you just believe that in business and in life, like you're going to go through phases that you have to reinvent yourself? No, 100%. There's no doubt about it. Like you have to be able to innovate and reinvent. You know, I look, I always hear this thing about Blockbuster. I used to go to Blockbuster in 2006. We got married. 2005, my wife on a Friday night, so we had Blockbuster in our little town. 
and we'd be holding our movies and I'd be looking at the popcorn, then we'd, you know, we'd get a movie in. Blockbuster doesn't exist today and they just fail to innovate and keep up and keep ahead. So I've had a few reinventions and, you know, having to uh, innovate and reinvent my life again. And just know, like, that's the game. That's life. And if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a business owner, even if you're an employee, right, you have to know how to adapt and adjust. And that transition, that was hard, Chaz. It was yeah. very difficult. To, I'm in this, you know, I'm in this world where there's, they're speaking this foreign language. Yeah. And I don't know this rates and uh, all the different things that was going on in the mortgage industry and real estate. So, you know, you got to learn how and just, just know, like, if I want to keep up and keep my life moving forward, I must be committed to innovating and reinventing myself. So it's, so you were talking about the years like 2004, 2005, 2006, 2007, like doubling, 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 but that, that probably led right into, I mean, I was in real estate at that time. I owned a real estate franchise and a mortgage company, man, 2007, 2008, it started to like wake everybody up. And boy, those were some rough couple of years for a lot of people in that. How, what, what was it like for you? I mean, you're double, double, double. And then what happened? Those, those we years? double, 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 double. And then like we had a nuclear bomb hit us. Yeah. And we, I was leveraged. We had everything tied into real estate. We had properties, developments, and then obviously the mortgage. And I was not prepared mm. for what was about to come. And it, and it exposed some of the weaknesses. You know, back in that time, I, I would say this. You didn't have to be very good to make money because yeah. money was so easy to be made. So when the tough and difficult times came, I was exposed and I'm so grateful because it exposed me to the point where we, we were evicted out of our home. We mm. lost the cars, all of the properties we had. I was so shell-shocked. I was so paralyzed. Like I, there were mornings I just sit there and I could not believe my bank account went from lots and then started to shrink and it wasn't replenishing. Yeah, yeah. And when we had to downsize and downsize, like there was this piece of me that just, you know, I, I kept like putting money into different things. Like, oh, we're going to be fine. We're going to be fine. We're going to be fine. And before I knew it, we're living in this 900 square foot townhome from this large home before. Yeah. And I looked at my Super Bowl ring, right? There's a picture right up here. Yeah. And like, we're like, we're broke and what took four years to build massive success got wiped out in like 12 months. Like it was fast. And I sold the Super Bowl ring. I cried like a baby. I flew to New York and just sobbing. Like I couldn't believe like how, you know, God, where are you? Why is this happening? Yeah. Yeah. And when I sold my Super Bowl ring, it was, it was one of the, it was like a turning point for me. I was like, I'm, I'm really here. Like this yeah. is happening. And you know, that was, uh, Chaz, that was some tough times, man. I, I just tell anyone that's an entrepreneur, you better be ready for the tough times. You better be ready for the market shifts. You better be ready for the economic turmoils and up and down. And this is why you have to adapt. I did not adapt and adjust. Like today, I can adapt and adjust fast to what I need to be. Back then, I wasn't ready. Do you think, and that's, uh, and again, you can, you can answer this however you like. And, and I, I, what I love about this show, when we have had guests on, I sort of ask some pretty pointed questions. And what's funny is people always go, man, I relate to that. I get, those are the comments I get. So I want to ask you something that, and I, and I, I, I've been there myself, not obviously selling a Super Bowl ring, but we, we got exposed big time during that shift to a real estate company, 70 agents. And I got a knock at the door and you know, Hey, you're five months late on the mortgage and this credit card's due. And it's just like so embarrassing, you know, and, and humiliating and you feel like, but do you think, I, I, I know for me, like if I look back at why I got exposed, I think ego too, like, like for me, I, like I was experiencing success. And so, you know, I kind of just got comfortable and I got like, nothing could happen and whatever. Like, did you get to a place where I'm just curious because I see this in a lot of business owners, like success almost becomes such a trap. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I will say it. I, ego was the enemy, right? It, pride yeah. got in the way. And, and I remember I had a mentor, even my dad, my dad told me, uh, he said, son, like I know, and I was driving a, a very expensive car. I had three very expensive cars, but all brand new. Yeah. And uh, it was about a half a million dollars worth of vehicles. And 
I just thought, man, there's nothing, man. I write checks and I, this is easy. My dad said, son, like times won't always be like this. Yeah. So puts him away. And I, I just ignored him. I was like, whatever. And I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, you're right. I'm like, you don't know. He don't know who I am. He don't know right. me. Right, right. And it was ego. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't, you know, I, all the savings that I thought was plenty, which is plenty. I was just not making sound decisions based upon solid principle. And so very leveraged, very careless, and um, just frivolous with the resources we had. And yeah, there was no, no, no questions. Back then, yeah. uh, success was a trap. And so today, you know, how do I avoid that? How do I avoid yeah, the yeah, trap? Right. You're like humble pie, man. Like stay humble, learn from other mentors. Like I can learn from you and from others. I have mentors and coaches. I, I'm in circles and, and then of course, like my best, my my best mentor is is my wife. Like she knows, yeah. like she knows who I am, and so she keeps me in check. And there's just a remembering. I love her. I grew up reading these scriptures where it's like remember, remember. Yeah. So I remember like those days, horrific. This is why even our our our, our grandparents and people who went through Great Depression and those tough times, like they're like this. They're like, hey, <laughs> don't don't do these things. And a lot of the people today in today's marketplace that didn't experience 2007, 2008, mm-hmm. um, like I would tell you, like, look, I'm not saying to go walk around like it's doomsday, but it's coming. But like, yeah, like when what there's what goes up comes down, and there's just cycles. And I like I have a good friend right now who's who's liquidating tens of millions of dollars of this commercial. This is him because he's like, it's coming, and when it does, I'll be cash ready. I'm like, good point. So, yeah, I you're you're spot on, man. Like. People, if you if you get too successful without staying humble and having to check, mm-hmm. uh, the fall is great, man, and it, and it hurt us. It really did, man. I think so. You said something there that I think is probably a, a, a tremendous lesson, and I hope everyone listening, if you're, you're just tuning in, I'm here with Satema Gali, husband, father, best-selling author, uh, former Super Bowl champion, and just a master at motivation, education, and training, and. Guys, I think one of the things you just said, Satema, that stuck with me is I think probably for both you and I right now, I think this is the lesson I learned through that too, is like, I think I had mentors in my life. I just wasn't listening close enough, right? And now I feel like, because you have to balance that humble, but also having some confidence in it to be a business owner. You have to be confident. But now it's like, oh, that's a good point. And you just said something that has actually been on my mind and something I'm talking with my mentors about, like we're all in this wealth accumulation mode right now of cash, 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 because we, we feel that coming again. And like, that was the thing as I had a lot of assets, but I didn't have a lot of cash when that showed up and those assets became worth not a lot when that thing, you know, especially the real estate assets and those got hit hard. And so guys, I, I hope you're here what people are saying. It's not doomsday, but I think we just be smart about what you're doing right now. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I wasn't listening, Chaz. I wasn't. I, I have people tell me, my dad, mentors, they're like, it's coming. Yeah. And I just like, dude, everything I touch turns to gold. And I just <laughs> had that. I, they don't know me. I, I, whatever I touch turns to gold. And yeah. now I definitely, I'm, I'm more alert and aware. Yeah. And I'm listening. And yeah. I think one of the basic principles, I just, if I make this much, I live here. If yes. I want to live here, I've got to make, you know, high. And so, yeah, great lessons, man. Yeah, I think what's interesting too is like what people think is a lot of money. When you hit those hard times, like like it's how do you create this sort of indestructible wealth? I obviously had wealth that could be destruct, destructed at that point or however you say it, right? Okay, so I want to take back to a moment though. You flew to New York, right? And you're, I imagine you probably, this was a last resort at that point, right? You've probably you've probably gone across a million different scenarios of how else, what else could I do before I have to sell this ring? Uh, but here you are, you're at that moment. And like you said, um, what was the plane ride back? Like I read, uh, I cried the whole way. So the, the flight attendants were like, are you okay? I was like, it was the ugly, right? Yeah. <laughs> I just snot myself. And I was like, I'm, I'm okay. And sure. I told him, I said, I'm going to come get that back. And he says, they never do. Oh, wow. He's got dozens upon dozens upon dozens of rings. And the plane ride back was very pensive. And I just, I was reading a book by John Maxwell called Failing Forward. Mm, yes. And I just said, you know, like, I will remember this. Now, now I am almost to the, the month, 
10 years from selling the Super Bowl ring. Wow. And the, oh, I can't even, I cannot buy it back. So let me answer your question. And the plane ride back was just that like, okay, I'm here. Yeah. And I didn't, it didn't crash in one night. It crashed over habits and weeks and months and years of just not really preparing. So I just, uh, I made up my mind. Like I, I was meant to do something and selling the Super Bowl ring, hitting the bottom. I'm going to make sure that this is part of an incredible story. Wow. That I can yeah. tell from the stage and it has been right. 10 years later, we live in Southern California. I, I'm living my purpose, my calling. I'm speaking, I'm coaching, I'm teaching, I'm writing books, I'm doing podcasts and I don't have the ring yet, but I will get it. Yeah. And I'm excited for that time when I do I want to ask you about that. Hang on a second on that. So, but something that you may not be aware of, because obviously, um, I don't know if you've listened to any of our prior shows, but you know what's fascinating? You just said something, and it's what almost every successful business, and and success obviously determined by your own right, but successful business owner who's been on here, uh, influencer, et cetera, has, has almost always been in a place where they had to take their mess and turn it into their message. And- so if you're listening right now, you're driving down in your car or you're, you've downloaded this and you're listening, you're like in the middle of the mess, right? And that's what I wanted to get to is like, you have the wisdom in the middle of the mess to say, this isn't going to define me. I'm going to, I'm going to take this, make it a message and turn it into something else. And you, you, you've done that. Uh, first of all, congratulations to you. I, I've always just been impressed at um, your message and the things that you share. I mean, I've been to your events and, and uh, they're powerful and, and, and motivating, but educational, like there's, there's people who can be motivating who aren't very educational and you're, you're uh, motivating and educational. Like I walk out with pages of notes. I was actually reviewing them prior for this. I'm like, man, that was good. That was good. That like, there's so much good stuff there. Your wisdom is powerful. Um, so you talked about 10 years almost to the month of getting that Super Bowl ring. Obviously you don't need to share amounts or anything like that, but I'm curious, like, do you know what it's going to take to get it back? I do. Uh, and I, I'll just tell you, it's going to probably take about a hundred thousand dollars because I cannot go buy it back. I have to go find someone's ring that from that year who has sold it or pawned it off. Mm-hmm. I have to take that ring and I have to go give it back and trade him. And I still keep in touch with the, with the collector. I have texted him like a year ago. I'm like, hey, what's up, man? He's like, Oh, I'm good. How you doing? I was like, I'm good. Just, just checking in. And there's been a few moments, uh, several times over the last handful of years, that I probably could have gone and done that. But my heart knows like I am in growth mode. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm in growth mode. So I, all my resources go back into mentors in my business and hiring and building our, our organization. And I also, my heart knows, like I listen. I know that it's not the time. Like I have three boys and my wife and my family and like I'm building my business and my family. And so the time is coming. I don't know when but it's going to take me to go hunt down someone's ring in a pond. And I know where there's a couple guys that I played with. I know where their rings are. So I've stayed, I've stayed alert on this. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but I'm ready to do that. So I, is, that, is it driving you right now? Get the ring back. It's not. Okay. It doesn't drive me because it's a ring with a lot of dimes. It represents something. Uh, the thing that drives me is impact. Mm. Like I know, there's just people in the world that I can help. And I know that like my time is limited. Yeah, right. So I'm going to impact and, and take that message to the world. And the ring will, you know, getting the ring back will be the byproduct. So how are you doing that? Let our audience know, um, obviously you're going to be speaking at connect and you're going to be at our event and you do some things out there and, and, uh, uh, tell, tell us what you do. Like, so if people listening, number one, how can they find you? How can they connect with you? What are you doing? How are you making that impact? Thank you. <clears throat> My website, uh, www.setemangali.com, S E T E M A G A L I.com. And obviously you can follow me on social media. Today, what I do is I work with leaders of companies and organizations through our coaching we have our immersion events we call Shield Maiden and Manuel, where people come to Southern California and they go through a six-week course and it finishes here in Southern California. Transformational. We have smaller group coaching. We have our podcast. I've got my books. And then I go speak and keynote. 
around the country. And then of course I'm, I'm a husband and a father. So I, you know, I take my boys to school and I live, I live my life. Right. So I can then tell the story and I don't believe in, excuse me. I told you guys that he, he was struggling to get well and it's no lie. He's, he's working hard to get well. <laughs> so I truly believe that again, from my perspective, it's not just about money and stuff while yeah. that's important. Yeah. Um, the impact you have, the people you touch and who you become in the process. I love, you know, Jim Rohn's like, it's not about setting goals. It's about who you become in the process. So yes. while I am a marketer and while I, you know, Instagram and Facebook and my podcast, I'm very careful and cautious to make sure that I live what I put out to the public. And there, there's got to be real congruency there. So between the keynotes, uh, our pro uh, pro rev live events, our immersion events, and then our coaching, I just know. And one of our clients that came through in uh, November, he just did his first event, and I saw his picture. And there's all of our content, our signs in his event. So the message is being spread. The message is getting out, and that's awesome. It's really one by one. So that's by the way, that's what I really. Uh, you know, you and I have gotten to know each other over the last year, but that's what I really love about you. And that's what I think is what attracts people to you is you are who you are. Like when I've watched your YouTube or I've seen you at an event or, or Instagram or whatever, and meeting you, like you're, you're that, you're that same person. And uh, there's an authenticity there that I think is very attractive to people that they're looking for in leadership. Um, yes, there's the marketing piece. Like, you know, I've got uh, people who help me with media and they're like, okay, do it this way, say it that way. And there's an sure. audience for that thing. There's, there's a place for that. But what I really love is just getting with people and teaching and all that kind of stuff. And I see that in you, you you do it at such a fantastic level. Um, guys, if you're following Satema, if you're not, you should be, uh, follow him on Instagram, YouTube, and uh, stay connected to him. So I want to ask you a couple last things here. Yeah. Who you mentioned your wife as a mentor, and, and I agree with that. Like, there's nobody that knows me better than my my wife, who's like, oh, you might need to check yourself there. Or you might like, or I've been in an event, I'm speaking, I get home, she's like, yeah, the garbage still needs to be taken out. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so they're great for us, right? That's such a wonderful thing. But who who else who else has been a mentor to you? Who else are you are you looking at now? Who else has been in your life? Because that's something that we talk about all the time on this show you know, people who've been in your life who are affecting you. Yeah. As you know, I go back to obviously my parents, my wife, my family, uh, you know, my, my parents have been huge. And as far as uh, not related to me, sure. my father was a big, big follower of Zig Ziglar. See you at the top. So I love Zig. Like I can hear his voice right now. I can mm -hmm. hear it. Uh, Jim Rohn, who passed away a while ago. Jim Rohn was huge for me. And, uh, you know, obviously Tony, I love what Tony's done is just as a marketer, as a presence and Darren Hardy, some of these guys who have, are really well known. And then, you know, a lot of marketers today, you know, they, they flash cars and yeah. the bling and, and that's not Satema. I have nothing against it or nothing. I, Cause I, I like nice things. Um, I really look to mentors who help me to find clarity. So I, you know, I have my mentors and people that I work with now and consultants and what I've learned is when my heart says you need to hire this person, it, it usually hurts my bank account. It hurts. Yeah. Like it's like, ugh. And it doesn't, it, it, that number is very relative and it challenges me to the core of what I believe about myself and what I believe about what's possible in the world. And you know, some, co most coaches I work with for about a year and then I'm, I'm done. And then I develop a great relationship with them. And then I keep, like you said, I, I keep my journals and I look through, I was just looking through some of my journals this week, but those are some of the big ones um, that, that really make a difference for me. And I would say this, like your coach or mentor does not have to be flashy to oh, be yes. successful and to, to, to move you. Most of my coaches that I've hired, you don't know who they are. They don't market. They don't have, you know, videos and Instagram. They're, they're nowhere. They came to me as an introduction from someone. And that's why I love them because I'm getting a very intimate, authentic relationship with them. So uh, the last thing about that is you start where you are. You start yeah. where you are. You don't have to go hire Chaz or me or some 
uh, other coach, you just, it's, maybe it's reading a book, maybe it's watching a, a podcast like this, you know, for many of you, for all of you listening to this, Chaz is the mentor and, and you start where you are and then you go from there. So yeah. I agree. It's so, so agree with that. So, um, so many good things there. I've always said the same thing about like hurting the bank account. Almost, I almost have always said that it's, or I've said it like I couldn't afford them at the time. Like in my mind, it's like that, that's why I knew it was the right person. If they're qualified, right. If they're qualified yeah. to, to do the right thing. So I just want to share this with the, with our audience. You know, we talk a lot about relationships in business, um, that, you know, there's the Facebook ads and there's all the marketing pieces, but when it comes down to it, relationships are what help grow things. And so I'm curious, how have you helped build relationships? Like if there's one tip you would give our audience to building relationships in business, what should they go out and do? What should they be aware of to help grow their network? What a great question, Jazz. One thing, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, one of the principles we teach, principle seven, which is listen. Mm. You know, if you really listen to what someone is saying, sometimes listening is, is all what you see and listening to what they're not saying by what they are saying. You can, you can really do a lot if you notice and you're really getting something. Because like people, like, if I want to build a relationship with someone, for example, like my wife, and, like, um, and then I'll use a business one. I have to listen to what she's saying and what she's saying about what she's not saying. I've got to listen to her body language and the tone. I've just, I've got to have this deep desire to want to have this like real relation and connection and uh, be able to relate to her. Same thing in business. When I'm walking into a business, I was just on a call um, right before we got on the podcast with uh, you know, the CEO of this you know, big company and whatnot. And we're talking about me being a keynote. And so I went into listening mode and I took this whole whiteboard full of notes so I could hear like, what does he want? What is he asking for? What does he not see that I can see by me listening and watching and, and really desiring to serve him at the highest level? And I believe that people would go about with this, just this desire to, to impact and what we call create value for. And if everyone said every day, I'm going to go create value for people no matter where I go. Yes. And they started to listen. You would, uh, you know, you'd really impact relationships because everyone has self-interest. I've got self-interest. You've got self-interest. The listener's got self-interest. And in a world where self-interest is this key thing, though it's Zig Ziglar, I believe, said this, right? The way that I get what I want is to go help you and others to get what they want. And the faster I do that with skills and mindsets that I develop, the faster I get what I want. That's so you know, true. And it's just this incredible thing. So, you know, the more we give to others, and again, you, you, I, I'm not talking about being a doormat and using that as an excuse to mm. overdo the principle. I'm talking about mindsets, skill sets, listen, desire to help. And if I help you and help enough people, I really do get what I want in return. That's awesome. So guys, let me recap this. You know, Satema shared with us how, you can take your mess wherever that's at, however big that might feel like, look, when it's your mess, it's the biggest mess there ever was. It doesn't matter. Like you don't compare your mess. Like don't, you know, people compare success, but don't compare your mess because your mess is your mess and it's as big and no matter what, right. And it's your thing. And so when you're in the middle of that, how do you take your mess and turn it into your message and then really get defined on where you want to go and create that. He's done that. He's also shared with us how to not let ego get in the way and to be humble and to yet still have a sense of confidence. And when you're out working with people to listen and, and those that are being going to be at connect, this is a perfect example and an opportunity to exercise that skill and work on that. Cause you're going to have people in the hallway and you're going to sit next to people and all that. Don't be the, the one who's just, blah, 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 here's what I do. And all that stuff, like, listen, ask great questions and get to know the people there. I promise if you do that, there's a magic that happens, right? There's a magic that happens and all of a sudden you're going to meet somebody and you go, well, this was, this was a great accident, you know, or this is just the weirdest thing that we got sitting next together. No, it always happens for a reason. Um, for those of you listening who are at our last leadership retreat, I was in the middle and Tim, I don't even know if you know this. I was in the middle of talking about building relationships and how I have a board in my office that I list people that I don't even know. I know who they are, but I don't know them. And I want to meet and that's, I keep 150 people on this list. 
I think at the time you were like number eight or 12, somewhere like right in there on this list. I'd been introduced to you via social media, et cetera. And I'm at the middle of teaching this and we go to break and I get a Voxer message on my phone from one of your coaches who used to be a member of, of our network and says, Hey, Satema is going to be in Dallas next week. We'd love to chat with you about how we can, you know, have you out to our event and everything. I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. I literally just taught this. Satema's on my list. And he reaches out to me at the break. And I shared that experience to our audience. You guys, you have to be intentional about networking and those you connect with. I don't know if you knew that story, Satema. I did not do that. So I got this big old grin smiling ear to ear. That's amazing. I love stories like that. I mean, I, I was like, blown. I couldn't even, I didn't, I'm, I always have something to say and I couldn't say anything else. Like, this is insane. But this is what happens when you're intentional. Like people call it um, the law of attraction or manifesting, or I, I just be, I just refer to it as being intentional. I, I, the intentionality was only your name was on a list at that point. That was it. That's all it was. So guys, and now Satem is on my podcast and he's coming to connect. And these things don't happen by accident. Get intentional and meet great people. Satema, thank you so much for being on this episode. Chaz, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I am honored and grateful to be with you and to know you and to be in your world. And I can't wait to see you connect, man. Likewise. All right, everybody. Have a great day. We will talk to you soon.